good afternoon and welcome back. This is the dialysis section. And uh, we have, do unfortunately, Dr. Ho, who is at Northwestern, uh, can't join us because she had a complication, I guess, this morning, so she won't be here. So we'll have only three talks now. We'll have time for questions. And then we're going to do a live session. We have four patients for ultrasound. And in a very brief break after the talks, we'll set it up so that we'll have live projection of the ultrasound imaging and the technologist up on the screens. So that should be a good way for uh, us to all observe the ultrasound. And Dr. Chopra will be moderating the live imaging of the ultrasound patients, one of whom is normal and three have some kind of venous insufficiency. So with that, Dr. Trabal is going to start us off with a talk about uh, is surgical technique versus intervention for uh, dialysis graft. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So um, I'm going to give a simple talk on just uh, basic definitions and how to uh, divide the techniques on, on maturing the AB fistula. So to it's so a little bit of a definition that a fistula fails early or never developed. That's what we're talking about. Uh, adequately to support hemodialysis. So it, in a nutshell, you need at least uh, 600, 700 cc's uh, per minute to go through that vein in order to connect a machine and allow it to run at 400 uh, cc's uh, per minute. So the problem is either flow or diameter. Okay, if you don't have enough diameter, the fistula will not mature. And of course, if you don't, if you don't get it to provide with the amount of flow required, then it's, it's not going to be useful. Uh, you can have problems with regards of inflow, outflow, or conduit. Uh, most of the time, the problem with the inflow is a poorly construct, constructed anastomosis. Or you can also have a small artery or a stenosis in the artery just proximal to the area where uh, the anastomosis is being constructed. Outflow can be due to stenosis or obstruction. And this is something that I just realized in my, in my laboratory. I don't know who runs a laboratory uh, within the group, but make sure that you speak to your tech to your text in the lab that the vein needs to be visualized uh, all the way through. Occasionally, they will give me a mapping that says, you know, three millimeters here uh, at the antecubital fossa, three millimeters at the mid-cephalic, mid-forearm, mid and 2.8 millimeters at the distal forearm. But then they did not note it or did not mention the fact that there was an area of stenosis of the vein where it was sclerosed and you do an anastomosis, and, and after you're finished, you notice immediately that it's pulsatile, right? So that could be a problem in some areas that you, you might feel a thrill, but there's already a sclerotic area, and this sclero sclerosis will, will turn into a, a high degree, a high grade stenosis later on. So the other problem is that you can have a, a it's with the conduit where the, there are many accessory veins that are stealing all the flow and it's not allowing the vein to mature or it's just uh, a vein that is too deep, okay? If you, if you have a vein that is too deep, you can still use it, but you need to know that you're gonna have a secondary intervention. On the physical examination, you, you'll know that when you put your hand on it, you're not gonna have a good thrill when you, or you're gonna have a pulsatile segment if you listen to it, most likely in the area where uh, the stenosis is, you're going to hear a high-pitched brewery. And the other thing is that you can actually see those veins that are stealing the flow from the AV fistula. If you, if you, on the initial examination, see that you have many tributaries, you might want to, after you construct the anastomosis, you might want to get rid of these uh, tributaries at the very beginning. And, you know, with ultrasonography, when you don't know what's going on, you can always look for the area of stenosis specifically with the ultrasound, and look for the area of, of obstruction, and you can make sure the, the depth of that vein. 
The strategies are the ones that we all know. You, you can use a, a balloon and geoplasty. Uh, I'll tell you that, that uh, for example, uh, the basilic vein, when you do a basilic vein transposition, they get, they get a lot of times, they get a high-grade stenosis near the axillary region. And in that area, it's, um, you know, you can put a stent, you could put a cover stent if you're gonna put a stent uh, in that area, but using a cutting balloon, it's actually, it's become a, it had become a very useful tool for me, okay? So stenting, I leave it for uh, times where I cannot get that vein to dilate, uh, or when I get a dissection, where I know that if I leave that dissection like that, uh, the guy is gonna come back thrombose, and occasionally I'll use an endograft if there's a perforation. Uh, most of the perforations you can actually control with just leaving the balloon up for a minute or two. So, you know, if you see a little bit of extravasation, don't go, don't go crazy on it. Most of, if, you, if you have actually opened the outflow properly, the, most of these uh, extravasation will just heal on their own. There is nothing that needs done. So the other technique is uh, call embolization for accessory veins. And those accessory veins can actually be treated as well with open technique. You know, it's very simple. Sometimes you can just uh, see the vein, you put a little bit of anesthesia. It doesn't matter if, it, I mean, I, it doesn't matter if you're a cardiologist or an interventional radiologist. I'll tell you that to ligate one of these veins, is, it's really simple. You just put a little bit of lidocaine, uh, make a little, you know, three or four millimeters incision, you're immediately gonna see the vein, and then you just grab it with a pickup, and you can put a clip on it, okay? Uh, what we know is that the, the interventions, uh, it, they're, they're, there's an average of 1.6 uh, to 2.6 interventions, depending on the size. So if you have a vein that is large from the, from the very beginning, you're gonna have less amount of interventions. And if you have a, a, a smaller vein, you will probably need more interventions. And, and the primary patency rate of this fistulas, it doesn't matter what the size is, you, you see that the, the primary patency rate is low. You know, less than half will, will be open at six months uh, with no intervention and very little ones if you uh, choose a very small vein. But you can increase the useful fistula by secondary interventions and you can, and, and there's no significance with regards of, of whether you use a smaller vein or a larger vein. You might need more interventions with a smaller vein, but in the end, you can, you can make a patent usable fistula, okay? So uh, for those who construct AV fistulas, they know that it, it, you're not done with your, when you finish that anastomosis. You know that you need to give follow-up, and they're probably gonna come back, and that you're gonna need to work on them to make it mature, okay? So, a lot of times if I, if I have a patient and he comes to my office and they say, oh, they, he has a, such little veins, well, you know, I put a, a tourniquet, see how much they dilate. Remember, those patients who are already on hemodialysis, they're uh, volume depleted. And if your office is cold, you know, when they do the, the, the vein mapping, plus they put that cold gel on it, you might see a vein that is like two millimeters, and then when you apply a, a tourniquet and manipulate a little bit on the vein, you just hit it, and it, it might go up to 3.5, and, and you know, people, I see a lot of people that they come in with a vein mapping that says that it's not useful, and, and I will actually end up with a nice uh, uh, native AV fistula. The other technique that I use is that if they have a good vein at the antecubital fossa, I'll put a graft from the radial artery to the antecubital fossa, and when this fails, then the cephalic vein and the basilic vein will, will grow larger. And then in the future, somebody that you actually started with a graft in the forearm, you, you will uh, convert into an AV fistula later on. So it's a strategy that I use, and it, it has worked very well for me. So anastomotic problems, uh, remember sometimes it's the anastomosis that is poorly constructed and sometimes it's that they develop a stenosis at that area. 
And it limits the flow. You see that he has a, this patient has a good vein throughout, but just not enough flow. So what the, the complaint is that they say, well, you know, the, the machine is not running well. We have to run it at 200 cc's an hour. You know, it's been a couple of times. And we were able to cannulate, but it, it can't maintain the flow. So then you know what's going on. And you do a fistulogram. This is easy to fix. There's just balloon angioplasty. Uh, I, don't, I don't usually, in this, in this area specifically, I try to avoid the cutting balloon, okay? The other technique, if you cannot get it to go, which you have to think, if you have intervened an area multiple times and it keeps coming back and you have a good result and looks good, but then, you know, three months later, he's back, and you do it again, and now it's six weeks later, he's back, and it's, it's like, it looks like recoil of that area. Then consider uh, doing an angioplasty of the area with open angioplasty. Just put a little patch there, open it, you know, send it back to the surgeon. He might, he might be able to fix that, and you might be able to give some uh, more life expectancy to that uh, fistula. So, of course, the other problem is that, like I mentioned before, they tell you the vein is really nice. You put the anastomosis, and initially you feel some thrill, but then at three months, they come back, and they say, oh, it's not maturing. Can we use it? It's all pulsatile. Well, you see an stenosis there. Well, you know, this is uh, not a big deal. You know what to do. Do an angioplasty. Same. Remember, if there's an area that has a lot of, you know, that it, 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 it goes... So the balloon start opening, and then you see how the balloon keeps opening, 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 and then you have a ring, a tight ring in the middle. Don't go crazy with the pressure. Just leave it there. If it doesn't release, switch to a cutting balloon, okay? So problems with uh, the vein, you know, vein being too small, and it becomes uh, the, the outflow issue. You can dilate it and make it look good. So the other thing is that it, it, this patient had the, the anastomosis performed, and early on it thrombosed, so we cannulated the, it, the fistula was cannulated, and then you could see that there was an area that there was no flow. Uh, you know, you do the angioplasty. A lot of these areas that are uh, apparently occluded, you can easily pass a wire on this vein. So you pass a wire, you do the angioplasty, and you'll be done without a problem. The accessory veins, like I said, you have multiple accessory veins. You can access it, and you can put some coils in it and reduce the, the flow through those accessory veins and help the, 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 main, of the main flow continue through the AV fistula. Or you can just, you know, it, w what I do sometimes is that I, I start by pressing the fistula. It has, uh, it gets pulsatile, so I go a centimeter up. It gets pulsatile, it's still pulsatile. I go a centimeter up. Now you don't lose the thrill. So I'm pretty sure that the, the main accessory problem is there. Or you can also uh, just put a couple of, of uh, needles, you know, like every three centimeters put a needle and just shoot some contrast in, and, and then by the needles, guide yourself, and now you know where the accessory veins are. If you're gonna do it open, that's the way to go. If you're gonna just coil them, then do that, whatever works. Remember, if you have a person that has a very little skin between the vein and, 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 and the skin, there's, there's no, uh, not much subcutaneous tissue, uh, they will feel it and see, see the coil. So in that, in that situation, you might want to either explain that well to the patient or just uh, do it open. So the, the death problem. So I'll tell you, this, this lady was a very nice case because she came in and she wasn't mature, maturing well. So the first thing that I did, she had a big accessory vein, so I made a little incision, you know, I ligated that, and then uh, she was a big lady. She had a big vein. It was like a seven millimeter vein, but it was too deep. They could not cannulate. So I made two little incisions and I just put it right there. If the people in the uh, hemodialysis unit cannot see that, then I can help them. You know? So, in conclusion, uh, size can be fixed. Uh, just d don't start with a, with a vein smaller than. Two millimeters, if you use a tourniquet, 
And if, if, if it doesn't go at least up to two millimeters, two and a half, just don't use it. It's not going to be any good. Um, stenosis can be fixed. Stenting might be necessary. Accessory veins, there are situations where you can embolize them. There are situations where you can just ligate them. And if it's too deep, you can always put them up. There's a publication now that somebody's doing like a, a oh my God, uh, the thing that you do with the fat, you know, you liposuction between the, between the vein and the skin. And you know, it, it's, they, they're reporting good results. It's an interesting concept. I, I haven't done it myself, but I can see how that can be done. You know, for me, just doing two incisions and, and getting the fat on, uh, uh, out of the way, it's a fairly easy procedure, but the liposuction, you know, it might be a, something to consider in the future. Thank you. Dr. Chopra is going to talk to us about uh, the use of covered stents uh, in dialysis fistulas. Is this for return or uh, for for return? Or for what is it? It's actually part of your repair. Okay. Process. Yeah. Okay. We're still waiting for uh, initial implantation for a de novo. Dialysis graft, but he's going to talk about the use of covered stents in repairing a failing dialysis graft. All right, good afternoon. Um, how many of you are using grafts now, endografts, after for in hemodialysis cases? A few, two, three, okay. Bear stents? Two, three, okay. Angioplasty? More people with angioplasty. All right, sounds good. So <clears throat> I've been using uh, endografts now for quite a few years, even before we had the indication. It was off-label, of course. And uh, dialysis is a uh, hemodialysis access management is actually a very simple concept. Slide one, advance. It's all about plumbing. You got to keep the circuit open. And uh, from the arterial anastomosis, as blood comes in, till the right atrium. What happens in that circuit? The way I look at it very simply is uh, veins are not meant to deal with arterial pressure, just the way nature made them. When you start pounding them with arterial pressure after the fistula or the graft is created, that AV access pressure now is hitting that vein with the high pressure it's not used to, just like if you lift weights, your fingers and hands will callus, the veins start to callus. And when they do that, you get a stenosis. And as uh, you heard earlier, it's about plumbing where either it's the caliber of the vessel or flow. There you go. So once you have a good flow, then the machine can pull out the fluid, the blood, clean it up, put it back in. When you can't pull out enough blood, or you, and the way the dialysis machine works is it pushes the blood in, so we see venous pressure goes up. You'll hear that the dialysis cannot happen, the venous pressures are too high, or they're aspirating clot out. So I'm going to focus on the use of uh, stent grafts or endografts and uh, how the outcome, the, the term, um, or rather the patency is longer. So a few years ago, the number was that the majority of the mortality in dialysis patients was not from their dialysis problems, but from access problems. And so a 50-year-old on dialysis had an average life expectancy around 50. And a lot of these grafts in accesses were kept open for a few months. They'd start with one forearm, go up to the arm, switch to the other side, arm, forearm, go to the legs, and now six, six months later, um, a few years later, there's nothing left. You're doing all desperate maneuvers. We have now been able to keep patients one fistula open for 12 years. So we, we keep working on them and try to find out how to maintain that patency. Uh, my disclosures. So here's an example. You've got an outflow, and you see what happens when you put bare stents, when you just do angioplasty. This stenosis is not like atherosclerosis. It is really a fibrotic response of the vein to the high pressure that it's not supposed to be dealing with and gets tight. 
when you plast it, they'll tend to rupture. That's why we need very high pressure balloons in uh, these cases. Then when you start putting uh, metallic stents, they have their own outcome. So to put it right out of the bat, metallic stents, bare metallic stents versus angioplasty, there's no advantage in terms of getting patency. I've been doing this for about 15 years. The first five years, I put in a truckload of bare metal stents. No matter what you did, every six months, more than half of them just came back. And we just had to keep finding ways to open this up more and more. And uh, so then we started experimenting with the endografts. I first did endografts, the Viabond mainly, in the SFA. As I started applying it, say, what's the next best thing I can do for this patient? I started working my way through that. Um, so a whole bunch of different covered graphs available. Uh, we'll look at them a little bit, but the most important thing was flexibility. Now, if you look at a surgical AV access graft, what that really is is a graft material tied between the artery and the vein. So the Vibon, it really is a graft material, and on that, there is an exoskeletal of nitinol wire. So I don't look at it as a stent. I look at it as a graft that happens to have some wire around it. So there's no metal exposed uh, on, to the blood vessel on the inside. The other ones tend to be uh, some graft on the inside, graft on both sides, but there's metal on the uh, exposed to uh, the vessel, so to speak. The two key players, fluency and Viabon. Fluency is metal exposed, it's flared at the end, and uh, the Viabon is really just a graft material. I look at the Viabon as a graft on a catheter. And uh, it can stretch a little bit, can be flexible. So if you have, imagine your elbow as you bend it, from straight, 90 degrees, and then you go as tight as you can, what would happen at the elbow joint? And then, uh, so at that bend, what you start to see is some other material would kink. On day-to-day -day activity, you're gonna keep bending your arm, the diastasis patient, so what happens over there? That's the radiographs of the two, and there's a lot of um, activity around the elbow joint and over the shoulder joint in, in diastasis access patients. So the idea was to be able to get uh, the access to be patent across the elbow. And these are just some pictures to show you that. If you have something stiff, like the fluency across the elbow, that's a problem. And you can see the stress forces that occur uh, across those joints. The other advantage of stent grafts is pseudoaneurysms that occur. Uh, you can actually place <coughs> the graft on the inside and then exclude this, because you can imagine this rupturing, and I've seen them rupture uh, in the lab, and you actually get through, uh, you know, there's the pseudoaneurysm contrast going on. What we've actually done is, in the cath lab itself, uh, placed the Vibon, excluded the entire aneurysm, but now there's a ball of clot sitting around the, the graft, and they still have to access it, so we've actually trimmed the pseudoaneurysm right on the cath lab table. As long as the flow is only through the graft and it, the aneurysm is excluded entirely. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of patients like that. Um, and they actually work well. And you can see this versus this here. When these exsanguinate, when these burst, they have a patient getting sanguinate. This, I've seen one in the thigh. Uh, that was not a good sight. Now, most of the stenosis that occurs in the AV graft is in the AV circuit is not at the arterial anastomosis. You'll have some, they t when they get thrombosed, they'll have a plug, a platelet plug. Most of the problem is in the venous outflow. And the venous outflow can happen right at the edge, if it's a graft, or along the length. We just talked about it. If you're used to carrying 20 pounds and now all of a sudden you have to carry 100, your body is going to react to that. So these veins, you can have a short segment or a long segment stenosis where there's fibrosis on the outside of the vein. And that's really the problem, the venous stenosis. And obviously, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So we had angioplasty balloons, so guess what we started doing? Angioplasties. So we would rupture them, but we were used to dealing with plaque. And for plaque, you don't want very high pressures, but this is not plaque. This is not atherosclerosis, this is scarring on the outside. We soon realized you need higher pressure balloons to rupture that fibrotic process. So we started to do that. 
So there was data that started to come up, but there were enough uh, come out that the angioplasty wasn't working. I remember doing these patients where every few months they came right back and back and back. And so then we said, okay, what's, something's not right with this. So we started doing balloon, uh, stenting them. The only thing we had stents. I was joke. you go to my disc, you'll get a muffler. You come to us, you get a stent. So we did the angioplasty, not opening, put in a stent and used to get a thrill. So clinical evidence of success is when you have a thrill. So if all the blood's zipping right by, you put your hand on the graft, you feel a thrill. If there's a pulse, means there's some obstruction to the outflow. So after doing all the intervention, the flow looks good, put your hand on the access, and there's a pulse. There has to be an obstruction in the circuit somewhere. Investigate that. And then we used to put the stent in, got a thrill, very good, few months later, stenosis. Why? It was intermal hyperplasia, metals would, would fracture, and then the work started happening. Well, how can we do this better? Here's a case where you have a graft material and you have bare stand, you can see the difference. And slowly we started to use more and more of stent grafts. So as we, you know, we would angioplasty this, we would, uh, and you can see, this is a 30, atmosphere balloon and there's still a waste. So we used to try and rupture that literally purposely and then put in a graft, go through. So earlier this was all off indication. But and as a physician you're allowed to do that. Uh, the FDA didn't approve it for grafts, but now in 2013 the Viabon has been approved for um, diocese access as well. Prior to that it was meant mainly for the SFA and I've used hundreds in there. And uh, when you look at bare metal stent versus angioplasty, lots of papers, average six months, 30%. So no matter what you did, six months, they were gonna come back. So we had to find ways to make it, keep the circuit open longer. And in the circuit, you wanted to find ways to make it so that when the elbow was bent, you did not have kinking and problems at that side. I actually seen a patient where uh, at the edge of the elbow, the metal, the bare metal was sticking out of the skin. Uh, so obviously around that time, at that side, it's not a good idea. So you want something flexible enough. So there was the revised study, which uh, was with the Viabon. It was a multi-center randomized uh, control trial study. And uh, the, uh, it was in treating stenosis of thrombotic or non-thrombotic, which would be stenotic uh, lesions. The uh, definitions here, target lesion, primary patency, which meant you had a stenosis, you angioplasty it, then you standard it. Uh, what is the patency if you did nothing else? And the circuit primary patency. In diocesis access, it is from the arterial anastomosis to the right atrium. That's your circuit. And from the time that you did the initial study till the next intervention of thrombosis, What's the patency? That's your circuit patency. And access secondary patency is the time from that study till the is not used anymore. It's been abandoned. And when the, the patients, uh, about 145 in each, a very similar group of patients uh, age-wise. The uh, PTA group, you can see the stenosis also very similar. Uh, obviously, there are no implants in the PTA group here. Um, the first thing is to make sure that it's safe. So at 30 days, that was proven that there was no major device procedure uh, failure, so to speak. Um, and then if you look at the primary patency over, if you do nothing else but just watch what happens, there is already now a significant difference at six months between putting an endograft and not putting one. So we know that angioplasty alone is just not good enough. You can put an endograft. The ones that thrombose don't do well, so that's why we do surveillance to make sure the graft doesn't clot off uh, and you catch them earlier. And uh, between balloon and just angioplasty, uh, between angioplasty and putting a graft, you've got a, almost a 20% difference. So you know patients are gonna do better. It, even so in the thrombosis patients. The Renova study was very similar, but for the barred uh, uh, flared stent. Now, the, the KDOKI guidelines, where basically this is the Diocese Outcome Quality Initiative, uh, they have guidelines that are uh, published on what should be the patency, et cetera. 
So you can see that the expectation was at 40% at three months and with a covered endograft, you are exceeding that. Uh, the other thing is when you look at secondary patency, that means something happened, it shut down, we opened it, now we're watching what happens. When you intervene again, that's your secondary patency. The secondary patencies in the PTA group are high because these patients got grafts, endografts in there. So uh, that's the important thing to remember. Without that, you can see that it would actually be in the 30% range. Uh, and that really makes a significant difference. And when you look at the number of interventions per patient, Again, you can see the difference uh, significantly between the two. The PTA patients tend to have to get more interventions than uh, the ones that you put in an endograft in as well. Um, the prior interventions did not affect. You saw that if you had put stents and angioplasties already done, and now we've put in an endograft within it, the patency didn't matter. It depended on keeping the circuit open, so that, that was a good thing. And flaring was not necessarily uh, required. So in this, let me go back if I could. Th this picture here shows that even if you had the graft was not opposed to the wall, but blood is flowing through, uh, it would still stay patent. So you did ne not necessarily have to flare this. The important thing I look at it very simplistically is that the more you mess with the vein, it's a natural response for the body to say, I don't like it. And it, it pushes back. That is a fibrotic response. Now, just by the nature of it that you've taken arterial pressure and put it on the vein, the vein's going to respond. So that's the first thing that happens. Then as we intervene, we want to find ways so that that vein is not constantly being stressed. So a lot of times I actually take a fistula, which has been a lot of interventions, and I actually convert that into a graft all the way up to the cephalic arch and I have patients where right from the radial anastomosis, maybe three centimeters or so above, all the way up to the cephalic arch, there actually is a graft. So you kind of converted a fistula to a graft. Fistulas, once you place them, they take a while to mature. It's like a good relationship, it takes a while to mature. They last a long time. When they go down, then it's very hard to revive them, but now we've figured out ways and that's where the endograft comes into play. Diasis grafts are like just casual dating. Six months, they work great, then they go down, you keep them open, six months, they go down, and that's the circuit that goes on, so. Um, all right, so in summary, diasis access is all about keeping the circuit open. You wanna find ways where you can keep it open a long time. Angioplasty alone doesn't work well enough. Bare metal stents, same as angioplasty. Covered endografts, much better options. I'm sure there'll be better things coming down the pike into how to keep these open as long as the patient's alive without having to intervene again and again. Thank you very much. I have several comments uh, that I'd like to share. Uh, I was always impressed with how uh, the technique of making a fistula is is actually very precise. Uh, you can't trivialize it. And when I was a surgery resident, they, uh, they allowed the second, third year residents to do the fistulas. And I think it actually requires a little bit more expertise than that to do really good fistulas. So some people are very good at making them. I was also impressed with the fact that what Dr. Chopra just said, once you have a good AV fistula, a native fistula, there are some people that never come back. And we don't really know what makes them uh, you know, be good actors versus the ones who fail if it's just the size of the vein or the technical expertise of the physician who put the, the graft in. And then when I was in interventional radiology and we did so many of these declots and repairs, there was a very good surveillance program at the University of Iowa that was quite successful, and at that time it was funded so that the uh, incidence of, of people coming back and the frequency was quite favorable because they were really keeping an eye on them and we fixed them before they went down. So unfortunately, there's not enough federal funding in most places to have a good surveillance program that really helps minimize the number of interventions. And then the other thing, I, I don't think it's anecdotal, someone, you might even comment on this. You have patients who are bad actors 
for, for whatever reason. And it became forbidden to actually mention that person's name. Because the minute you say their name, it's almost like the phone rings and they're saying that their fish is not working. Huh? It's a true. It's really, it's an interesting group of people to work with. Yeah. You know, if, if anybody have a relative who's been on dialysis, that's the way to appreciate what these dialysis patients go through. You know, the f it's not just that person, the whole family. So that if in this study, 99, 7 and 9 percent had hypertension. So they've got all these comorbidities. Diabetes is a huge problem. And then every few days, two days, they've got to get hooked up to a machine. Their energy levels go up and down. A lot of them just are not healthy running around on their own. And it is quite a challenge for the entire family and the support ecosystem. And when you get a good fistula going in, for them it's a blessing. Because, and then the infections, the problems that come in, admissions to the hospitals, and dialysis is a very random process. All of a sudden, access not working. You're in, in, in the center, it's a Friday night, nobody wants to take their call, you go to the ER. Randomly, you get a new doc, somebody admits you, somebody doesn't admit you, a novice finds, gets a hold of you, and somebody will stick a subclavian catheter, which means now your entire arm is not good for dialysis anymore. So a lot of this now is getting streamlined with guidelines. And you know what the best surveillance I found? Is to teach the patient how to feel their own access, and the second they feel a pulse, they know there's a problem. Thrill changes to a pulse, Thrill changes to a pulse and they get very, very attuned to that. Uh, and the ones who, it's all about managing your energy, no matter what you do, and these patients soon start to realize uh, that if they get that diocese well, then they manage their energy and they manage their life very well. And for the diocese center, having an empty chair is lost revenue. So they want to keep these patients coming in and happy and healthy and going uh, through all of these. So it, it's quite a challenging uh, process and the surveillance becomes very, very important. I wanted to make a quick comment. I, I am convinced that the same reason why some people, you put a stand in the coronaries and they come back at three months and then this, these same people, if you serve, I'm pretty sure that if you do surveillance on these individuals, if you put a stand on the, on the leg, it's gonna fail as well. And so I think it's, it, those who are bad actors, they just form neointima hyperplasia faster. And I compare neointima hyperplasia to keloids. There are those who do that and those who do not. So, you know, uh, if you ask me, it's, in the patient, it has, you know, cause, cause I, every, every surgeon has those that keep coming back and they use the same technique with those that they don't ever come back. So I, I think it has to do with the patient. And when you look at, at the inflammatory process that it's uh, inside the vein and outside the vein, it's just very typical. And the only way I can explain that is that it, it has to do with the patient not with anything else. I think the key word is inflammatory process, and there's something to do with diet, the general protoplasm of the patient. Because there are coronary patients who everything looks fine, and they just keep knocking things down. Cholesterol is normal, everything's normal, and they blame it on inflammatory processes. So I think that's the key there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kassab? As Dr. Kassab is going to talk to us and give us our last talk of the session before we do the live ultrasound, and he's going to talk, us about, talk to us about the future of uh, interventions in the outpatient lab. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, well, <clears throat> this is really a uh, either uh, look at it as a continuum of uh, my talk yesterday, talking about the. Uh, <clears throat> business of uh, medicine uh, essentially outside the uh, realm of the hospital. <clears throat> when we look at the uh, historical uh, overview of uh, access centers, you know, outpatient medical procedures began their shift approximately 20 years ago with the formation of ambulatory surgery services and renal dialysis centers. <clears throat> 
Cardiac cath and endovascular lab services were just the normal migration recently of the existing services that moved from previously exclusive and hospital services to the outpatient SANIC. Let's talk, let's uh, explore some facts here. What's the landscape? As of 2010, more than 590,000 patients in the United States were being treated for end-stage kidney disease, a tenfold increase from the 1980. According to the U.S. renal data system, the number of people on dialysis approached 400,000 in 2011. And it is out of 27 million patients with, uh, with chronic kidney disease. The overall prevalence of uh, hemodialysis patients is expected to rise to 2 to 4 percent per year, with 65 percent of end stage renal disease population were on maintenance hemodialysis at $87,000 cost per year per patient. Prevalent rate of uh, end stage renal disease continue to rise. With this increase in hemodialysis patients comes the challenge of maintaining the dialysis access of these patients. We've heard a lot about that. Native fistulas have become the most common type of uh, most common type with lower uh, all-cause mortality and infection compared to grafts and casters. And obviously, the subset will. Uh, fail over time and present with thrombosis, and that's when they head to the access centers. Over the past 15 years, percutaneous thrombectomy has become the first line management of clotted fistulas, with the success rate clearly exceeding way 90, over 90 percent. Now, we've seen an upsurge of peritoneal dialysis lately. PD provides better quality of life and confers a survival advantage compared to hemodialysis. And I will show you some of the economics around it and highlight it to you. Fluoroscopy-guided catheter placement may be ideal for urgent start PD. There's, a, there's, a, there's an advantage uh, to urgent start PD. Those patients at, uh, at, uh, will, 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 will be Medicare eligible immediately once they get started, as opposed to hemodialysis. They have to wait about 60 days to become Medicare, Medicare eligible. As percutaneous techniques continue to evolve, continuing to approach hemodialysis patients with heightened level of caution is important in ensuring successful outcomes. CMS and the members of the renal community have come together to start the Fistula First uh, initiative with the goal of expanding the number of patients with fistulas except <coughs> as opposed to catheters or grafts. Over the last decade, remarkable improvements in AV fistula use is prevalent in hemodialysis patients were achieved through the fistula first breakthrough. We call it the FFBI. In partnership with Medi CMS, uh, uh, the end stage kidney disease networks, patients, uh, the renal community, and, uh, and additional stakeholders. A fistula is clearly the gold standard because it has lower risk of infection, etc. You've heard, you've heard uh, Dr. Shupra talk uh, uh, quite well about it. Why office-based? Well, how's, let's, let's explore the economics in here and uh, look at the uh, uh, lands, uh, landscape. Your wish is your command. Well. This paper is by uh, Dr. Krishna Jain that was pub published in JVS. I'm sorry for the, uh, uh, f uh, it, it's, it's not well, uh, very well visible, but I can summarize it to you. 2010, Dr. Jain and his group in Kalamazoo, Michigan have concluded that surgeons need to move to the outside and, pro and proceed with their outpatient uh, uh, vascular centers. And in 2014, about maybe a couple of months ago, he published this in JVS. They studied about uh, uh, 3,000 patients, 6,500 procedures for a period of five years. And it was really the first and the, big, the largest uh, database that we have on the uh, uh, safety, uh, on the outpatient, safe, outpatient safety of patients uh, treated uh, uh, in outpatient vascular centers. Today we call them outpatient uh, interventional suite. Uh, 
Dr. Jane is uh, part of our founding fathers of the, our new society, the OEIS, the Outpatient Intervention Interventional Society. Well, this concluded then it pertaining to endovascular, renal access, and, uh, and uh, venous uh, work. The numbers, the complication rate is very, very low on the outpatient side. Well, again, this is a crowded uh, uh, slide on top. You see that the most commonly performed procedure in their experience was uh, the uh, fistula work. And if you look at the uh, patient complication uh, rate of procedures, they're very, very low. Um, the, the, the largest complications on this, uh, on this slide you see are in arterial interventions where the complication rate is about 5%, clearly lower than the hospital. Most common complications in here are hematoma and thrombosis. And if you look at the average number of, uh, of visits per year uh, for the uh, dialysis patients, the, uh, the average number is about 2 to 2.5 times per year. So why office-based? It's convenient to the patient and physicians, less costly to the patient, less costly to the insurance companies, more efficient, and clearly safer. We've seen that. Now, we've observed a decline in payments recently. Over the last several years, there has been a progressive decline in payment of va for vascular procedures. The Deficit Reduction Act of 2005 kicked it off, where we took, a, especially in cardiovascular, we took a major hit. The, vas uh, re the, the lab reimbursement came down about 18 to 51 percent. And last year, Medicare, at this meeting, actually, it was announced Medicare proposed their, their pay cuts up to 50 percent again, but we developed the society, the OEIS society after that and thwarted all their efforts. And we reduced these numbers to about five to six percent. They're even lower for dialysis access. So it still makes a lot of financial sense to proceed with, uh, with, uh, with access centers. So the overall negative impact has been calculated to be about five percent in a vascular practice recently. Medicare has started to bundle more interventional procedures Independent centers now, if we look at the financials, it takes about 450 patients, it takes a large number of patients, about 450 plus, and perform high volume of procedures to be able to acquire and, and uh, proceed with your own center. Otherwise, the large organizations can improve the economics and might be a smart partnership for a center with a marginal volume of procedure. That will keep you away from the hospital. Uh, to me, you know, with the with the uh, with the with what's going on over the past few years, the hospitals became a danger zone for us. They they haven't looked after our best interests. Hemodialysis makes patients eligible for Medicare, like I told you, at 60 days and urgent start PD immediately. And also, there's another financial uh, uh, perk for PD patients is that there's an eight to ten thousand, eight to nine thousand dollar reimbursement to dialysis center just for the training alone. And today, there's a hundred and fifty percent increase in reimbursement to uh, for uh, PD uh, patients to the dialysis center. Productivity in a dialysis center and in an access center is is definitely increased. There's no terrible time to the hospital. You don't have to wait for the hospital procedure room to be free. See your patients in between cases. You can do all kinds of procedures. And even though reimbursement has dropped slightly, you still get the facility fee, so it's better reimbursement for the, for the uh, professional component, time management, patient care, so on and so forth. So essentially, your revenue will increase. Your patients will see the same care providers. Your staff know your patients, spend more time with patients before and after the procedure. It's friendly, familiar environment. Make it as comfortable as you want. So let's look at a little bit about the, the economics, the financials. If you, if you really look at the office, the office is a place of service 11 as far as CMS is concerned, and the hospital can be either a 21 or a 22. So the reimbursement fee schedule is clearly different. If you look on the left side, uh, on my left-hand side of the, uh, of the screen, uh, if you look at fistulogram, which stands $4,500. Uh, 
in the office. In the hospital, 594. The supply cost is 1300. So if you look at the supply cost for a fistulogram, it only costs 100 bucks at this time. The whole complicated slide, this highlights the differences between the 2013 and 2014. The difference is dismal. You know, uh, there was a drop of 19 to 20 dollars, 25 dollars per case, which is really different from, a, from, from what we've seen in 2005 with the Deficit Reduction Act. And if you look at total revenue in here, office versus hospital, you know, obviously the numbers are much more uh, encouraging what you see uh, uh, on the outpatient. Now there are two, uh, four new dialysis codes, two for arterial and two for venous. Uh, these are the codes if you're interested in. These are, uh, there's today bundled uh, surgical uh, uh, work of stent placement and also the radiological supervision and interpretation. And geography and PTA is being bundled into this. The ingredients for success, you, gotta, you really have to make sure that we are accredited at our center in uh, Michigan. We are Quad A acc uh, accredited. It's nice to see all these people in, under one roof, the cardiologists, surgeons, IR, general surgeons. Success always going to be volume dependent, including a multi-specialty approach with entrepreneurial and high volume physicians which significantly improve your chances of a successful venture. Ingredients for success, obviously, location, 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 and I add that people, people, people. You gotta surround yourself with the best staff. This is our center in, uh, in, uh, in Dearborn. Um, I would like to remind you that branding and marketing is gonna be your ticket. And remember the scale, the satisfaction, collaboration, adaptation, and location. Satisfaction is a, is, a, is a guiding tenet to the outpatient interventional suite, a, a foundation for customer loyalty, a means of building our brand. Better than all surveys, who else other than Andy Taylor, uh, the guru of enterprise rent a car, developed two questions. This was published in the Harvard, Harvard Business uh, Review. What was the quality of your experience, and would you come back to us again rather than five minutes worth of, of filling up paper for, uh, paperwork. Patients don't want these steps. People hate bureaucracy. Collaboration, another tenet of the OIS, foster unity among peers, specialties, service partners, and healthcare industry, and share best practices. We are now six months into our partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield. They have hired an employee that works in our Dearborn Center that's collecting data on endovascular procedure and soon on dialysis access management. And this will be our third party validation that our patient centers are less expensive without compromising patient, patient care. And hopefully we can showcase that they are safer than the inpatient. Adaptation, that's easy. Our patient centers best suited to change in fluid healthcare climate. Today, change to our advantage versus traditional hospital bureaucracy and the location. Location is not only your physical location, but you have to locate yourself amongst uh, amidst providers, play a distinct advantage, and safety and convenience, quality and cost will become very important. Education is always extremely important. Healthcare relies on learning new procedures, policies, and practices. And in conclusion, the freestanding outpatient facility has evolved into a mainstay of dialysis access care and has been shown to provide consistently reliable and efficient care. Initial concerns with safety and quality have been largely quieted and dispelled. Challenges regarding the growth and survival of these centers are now largely focused around public policy, regulation, and the erosion of reimbursement schedules. So just do it. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Dr. Kassab. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me to, to do that dialysis as an outpatient. So uh, are there any questions from the floor for anyone here? Well, if not, we'll uh, ask if you'd like to just stand up and we're gonna rearrange the tables and the podium a little bit. You can go get a cup of coffee or water and cookie. And please come back so you can uh, learn from these uh, patients who have volunteered to uh, be examined today. Thank you.
You think you get it? Well, I was going to have everyone come up, bring your chair and come up here and make a small circle so we can be close enough to uh, gain from doing this. Well, we were going to do that, but I think that one at a time is going to be more instructional. Yeah. Okay. Good? Okay, that's great. Well, you can still sit here and watch it. If you like to be in the front row of the movie, I do. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, this is a work in progress. We'd like to bring our first volunteer to come up. Our first volunteer is um, normal. <laughs> And Dr. Chopra is going to be commenting on any of the, the Venus anatomy so that you can learn from watching. If you have any questions about how to hold the probe or what you, you're interested in, um, I think it's very important for the physician to know how to do it. You have to be able to have a good technologist, and we rely on them tremendously. But sometimes you'll get someone who isn't very experienced, and you have to know what they're missing. So once you get a really good technologist, it's wonderful in your life because you can trust what they do. But it's really important for us to become RVTs as well and to be able to, to bring, teach, and, and make sure the technologists are doing what you want them to do. I'll let uh, Dr. <laughs> Chopra take over now. And actually, while doing the procedure, your ultrasound skills are really what sets you apart, Some, especially when you're getting access. And you really, the secret of treating venous, superficial venous disease is the following. All the problems are from increased ambulatory venous pressure. Normally, at the ankle, when you're at, at flat, supine, is zero. The minute you are vertical, whether you're sitting or standing, the pressure starts going up. If your calf pump works, it keeps draining it out, and that's where 20 to 30 is the baseline. So if the reflux occurs, you gotta find out where it is, and that's what ultrasound helps you with. So you cannot rely on just an ultrasound report. When you're doing the procedure, the ultrasound skill is really what makes the difference. <laughs> All right. So. The important thing here is gravity. So if you send somebody for an ultrasound report and they do it supine, not good. You can have severe reflux appearing totally normal when it's done supine. So the ultrasound must be stunned, done standing. Yeah, with, with time. <clears throat> So a couple of things I do for that. One is I tell my patients, drink a lot of water. If you're dehydrated, that's lower. Second is I tell them to stay standing and not wear their stockings for at least 24 hours before. And when they come to the office, I make them walk around, stand. Sometimes I'll see them as they stand here for 15 minutes, I'm gonna do read a book or something, and I'll come back. And that standing in one place is the worst thing you do for your feet. That's why if you look at all military personnel and the old Police, military, uh, in the British, they used to have those socks around for them when they wear shorts, was just to activate the calf pump. That's one flights. If you're just sitting, blood just sits there, your calf pump's not working, you get more DVT. So uh, pumping the calf is the best thing. So I tell all my patients, have you ever seen a ballerina with varicose veins? Sorry. You see very few because they work their legs a lot and the pump's working and the blood's flowing out. So, so we've got to do it standing. We've got uh, somebody's head in the way, right? With the, there, who was that who just moved? 
There you go. Okay. No, no, you were fine. I think there was somebody in the audience whose head was there. So what we are looking at, he, she's, uh, you are now looking at her, you're right there, the saphenous vein. Is that not projecting? Oh. Okay, no problem. And essentially in your mind what you got to do is not the picture per se. So when somebody's standing, so look at me standing, imagine how the pressure at my ankle in the superficial venous system is reflected from my heart down there. So I've got greater saphenous uh, vein going down. There's a saphenofemoral junction. I've got a competent vein valve, so the pressure is not going down. If that valve broke, what would happen? All that would flood down till the next competent valve. So if there's a branch before that, what will happen to the pressure? It will go down that branch and then keeps going down, that pressure has got to go back in somewhere. Where does it go back? It's some other perforating branch. When the vein continues to dilate, at some point the valve just can't hold it anymore. So a door is meant, designed to fit the door. You stretch the frame a little bit, it'll still shut. Imagine it's bigger than the size of the door, now it swings freely. So in your mind, you've got to know the pattern of the flow and which valve's broken and you first go and fix that segment and stop the pressure. So you start from the top and go down. So when we do the ultrasound, as you can see now, she's looking at the saphenous. Can you go up to the saphenofemoral junction? So as an operator, you should be able to do this very well find the saphenofemoral junction. So you can see some of the blood flowing. No pointer? Any pointers? Got it. Got it. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, right there is the saphenofemoral junction. That's the common femoral. And she's standing, and you can see that's her saphenous vein. If there was reflux, sometimes you just see it freely go back and forth. And you can do it just with respiratory motion. Deep breath and you'll see the blood flow right back. Now you examine this in the standing position. When you're doing the procedure, the patient's supine. And you measure the amount of reflux, how many seconds it is. You can see there, you can see one leaflet right there. How are you doing there? Okay, good. And you can see the color. If she took a deep breath, can you take a deep breath and hold it? You, did you see that? Breathe. And you see with the phases of respiration, you can see the flow back and forth. So the way to think of this is, if you are standing at a, in a, you're in a helicopter, and you're watching the highway, and there's a toll booth. You see traffic come up, you know there's gonna be some toll given, and then they're gonna flow back. Imagine that's on a, on a high, on a slope. Right? So you got, as the traffic comes up, they got to slow down and then they got to move back up. Imagine you're standing there watching it and, and then you know, whatever goes forward keeps coming right back, keeps going right back. What's going to happen to the traffic behind? Pressure is going to go up. That's what we call venous hypertension. If the pressure is too high, where's the first place that people are going to go out on the exits? Those are the branches. And that's what you're trying to identify what's broken. All right, where are you, young ladies? Sit again. Okay, so now the way we do that, she's now in the proximal tie, right there. That's a normal young. If it's cold, we have vasoconstriction. Anxiety, vasoconstriction. All those things add to it, and you can and you can see that dehydration, vasoconstriction. Are you nervous? A little bit. Not 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 really. Okay. But you know, I mean, and, and you can see that uh, it's in the, can you show uh, kind of the Egyptian eye, just pause right there, perfect. So you see this, and then this here, that's the saphenous fascia, that's the vein in between. We call it the look like an Egyptian eye. So when we do the procedure as well, that's where you put the tumescent in, in within the space. 
You can have a duplicated saphness sometimes, you'll see a branch go out, but that's the saphness that you're looking at, and this is in transfer section. We saw the saphnofemoral junction, saphnofemoral valve, and you measure the reflux. Can you show at some point how you measure for reflux? So obviously, the number of cases that are being done have been increasing dramatically. So insurance companies are paying for this. And they're all of a sudden seeing that the amount of money they're paying for this is going up. What do you think they started to do? They want to say, how do we pay less? So they're starting to track it. They're starting to measure it. Earlier, they didn't care. They said, fix it, send a bill. Now you have to follow all the guidelines, which come from the literature. So venous insufficiency causes venous hypertension, which then causes varicose veins and all the other changes, whether it's an ulcer, et cetera. So you have to document venous insufficiency, and that is documented by documenting reflux. Less than 500 milliseconds is considered normal. So you got, whether it's a perforate or a branch, and you got to document how it goes up there. So arterial flow, triphasic, correct? Venous flow, straight line and then changes by respiratory motion. How are you folks doing over there? She's just too normal for you guys. Yeah, let's get some reflux in. It's okay, when we need to demonstrate something. Can you just show the lesser saphness for once? While you just have it for a second? So, so the concept to remember here is the saphness vein is within its own fascia, joins the saphnofemoral junction, right, and comes down all the way to the ankle. The lesser saphness is doing the same going up into the popliteal vein. And we're trying to find this. So experienced operators move very quickly. So if you can't find something, just slow down. Just put your probe in what you're familiar with. Common femoral vein, keep it there. And then slowly work your way down. And I orient this, so there you see the, that's the lesser saphness, just a couple of millimeters. And it's just, there's not a lot of flow through this and she's just normal, so she's just pumping it all out. <laughs> Yeah, go up further. Yes. And if you saw those presentation where the nerves go right by, you have the posterior tibial and the saphenous nerve, those are the areas where the nerves are very close by. Can you, can you slow down just a touch and see if you see any nerve in that sheath as well? Sometimes you'll see the nerve right next to it. It's hard to pick it up, but it's, it's sometimes you'll see it. All right, no worries. Let's get somebody who has some reflux and go. So if you had a patient like this in the office and you still got to see stuff, make them drink a lot of fluids, get them to somehow walk around a lot, get warm, vasodilation, and then helps a lot. No, I mean, it doesn't matter. If somebody slept and was supine till two in the afternoon, three they'll be just like you woke up in the morning. So I make sure, because it's impossible to schedule just more, but if I have a patient who is really skinny, they're complaining of problems, and we can't find them routinely, then I know something's not right. So then I tell them, come at the end of the day after you've worked all day, you've been vertical all day, and then drink a lot of fluids, keep standing, and then you find the disease. Oh, yeah, I repeat it. Then I'll go in the room myself, look at it. So the way to look at this is when somebody's complaining, there has to be a reason. If I ask the patient, where does it hurt, they'll see my light, so show me with one finger. You put your finger on it, you press it, they go, ow, you put your probe on it, you'll see a perforator with reflux underneath. My entire staff, medical assistants, have learned to do that. So they'll go and they say, where does it hurt? Right there. And you will feel along it and you go, ow, put the probe on it, you see a perf, you can feel the pressure. So that's very important. 
and, and then kind of follow through with all your patients to kind of correlate your clinical com symptoms, complaints, what you're finding. So if you have an ulcer, there's lipodermatosclerosis, it's just in one area, everything else looks fine, you gotta f trace it back. to it. The way I explain to the patients, you go to your basement and there's a big patch on the wall. It's stained. You paint it once, a few weeks later it's stained again. So what's going on? Something's leaking. So now you're not gonna go search for the pipe on the other side of the house, you're gonna search for the pipe behind it. And you work your way through the connection and that's exactly what you do here. Well, it's nice that she has large Look veins that are going to show you exactly what you're looking for. So, and you see how tortuous this can be within the fascia as well. Now, it's sometimes when you're doing that, you may not be able to thread something up. And, and you see how it's starting to exit. So, could you slow down there for one second? And just watch how with breathing. Can you take a deep breath, please? Blow it out. Do you see the flow? Can you go longitudinal for one second? And take a deep breath. Again. She needs to put color on, right? Yes, yeah, she can. Even without color, I want to just show that you'll see this moving back and forth. And now we trace this right back up further into the saphenofemoral junction. So you must know where the common femoral vein is because that's the one thing you never want to shut down. I call it the edge of the cliff. I know there's an edge here. I'm not going to go over it. So in this case, I have to stay behind it. We do this every day when we are driving. We know where the wrong side of the road is, you, you, so you drive within the lines. See, the art uh, artery is pulsating. Can you measure the width of the, the saphenous there at the junction? It's about a centimeter right there. Yes, some insurances will require that. And they will not approve anything, like a perforator less than 3.5. Now, you have somebody who's 250 pounds, big guy, 6'7", just big in, by nature, he's gonna have bigger vessels. You have a 92-pound woman with pain, that's when the problems come up with some of these guidelines. And also, all this data is from Caucasians. And as you study health uh, globally, you look at the Asian populations, they're just different. And you have to compensate for that a little bit, but insurance companies have their guidelines and they go by what's published. What's that reflux? And Romy, why don't you point out exactly what you're looking for for people who aren't familiar with the... Sure, sure, I was just waiting for her to freeze that. All right, so she's gonna show it to you now. So there was flow in one direction and you saw that there's reversal of flow and then goes out for so many section, seconds. And that is counted in how many milliseconds that reflux lasts. So normally, as you squeeze the calf, blood moves forward, the valve works on it's coming back, it stops, boom. That can be a few milliseconds. She augmented, you saw that? And then, so this went from here where the flow reversed. It should have stopped right here, about roughly right here, but in fact, it just keeps going back. That means the valve's incompetent. You need these pictures. If you get audited, somebody to say, yes, there actually was something. So we actually have a matrix. We create a spreadsheet. Where to saphenous at the saphenofemoral junction, mid-thigh at the knee below, and we keep going down. All the perforators, lesser saphenous, the same. We measure how many seconds and whether there's reflux or no reflux. Is it Say it again, please. Is it, it depends. You can change it. What have you set it up for? It's a centimeter right now from here to here. The oh, the time. It depends. You can change the scale, so she'll show you in milliseconds. You just see it twirling around. So you know, you'll have, you can look at it longitudinal as, as well as transfer. They'll show you again. So can you pause there for a second? There's a little Mickey Mouse appearance, you see that? 
common femoral in one ear, second ear. But this is pulsating, that's the artery. Okay, and see that. Can you put color on that, please, for a second? So color on the artery for a second. So we know that's the artery. Boom, pulsating away, common femoral. So we want to stay, and then here's the femoral vein now. Can she point out the inferior epigastric vein? I'm sure she would be able to if you go. I was right there. So the inferior epigastric, as it empties down uh, into the common femoral the saphenous, sometimes as you do your ablation, you want to stay below that. You get very little chance of clot in the common femoral. So when you're doing the ablation, you want to stay below that. You've not had any procedures done before ever, right? Have you had some procedures? Have you had any procedures done? I had a scleral therapy in my cervix. Ah. Sure, actually, uh, can, is there a way for us to just look at it? Can you turn around? Okay, so if you look at her leg for one second. So we see a big branch, anterolateral, coming out, going down. Her incompetence could just be from here to here. It doesn't have to be the whole saphenous. And the pressure is reflecting from there going down. Could you take your ultrasound and just follow the branch up slowly? Just go transfers on the, on there and a little more gain up. There you go. So you see that branch, all that is the vessel right there, the vein, which is right there on the thigh. Can you brighten it up so the screen gets brighter too? So a little brighter on you. There you go. Okay. Now follow that up. You'll see as she takes the ultrasound, goes it up, keeps going up. I want them. I want them to be able to see where this branch enters into the saphenous. And watch the probe here. And stop, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Right there, you see that? Now go back up the other way. Uh, when I say it. there, stop. So the branch there, you, it went out of the fascia. Did you see that? Where it went out the fascia and go in? So treating this, if you treated the saphenous right down at the knee, it would make a difference. That's an anterior accessory, right? Yes, it's right. the anterolateral branch. And that's what you want to foam. Well, first thing is you got to take care of where the... Uh, incompetences. The incompetence is right here. Mm -hmm. So it, now if you look at where, and it's very short distance. This is one of the tricky ones. If you're just starting, this is not your first case. Say it again? True, but you got to be careful that, yes, you can. Just that short segment. But this is a really short segment. And you want to be able to make sure you're not in the common femoral vein. And, and, because that, once you cause a DVT, you condemn the patient to anticoagulation, a possible PE, and a lot of other problems. So um, that, and hers is very unusual, and you see it's quite deep. You know, this is something you almost treat like a perforator. And what I would do there is block that, I mean, ablate that portion, and at the same time, foam everything else on the side. Like one and four, sort of decal, that means they took 3% sotradrachal, diluted it up one-fourth, so 0 0.75, that's pretty concentrated. Let it sit in that whole saphenous all the way down, and then give them very good compression. No, so this, this is the point of junctional reflux. So it's not coming from the common femoral? It is from the common femoral. From the common femoral through the saphenofemoral junction, into the saphenous vein. But that saphenous vein is incompetent for a short distance, then it's competent underneath. It's normal. Why do you want to burn it? Nope. Who told you that? Go hit him on the back of the head a couple of times. It's normal vein. Why would you shut a normal vein down? So when it becomes incompetent, we'll treat it. The venous return from uh, below, they're, they're perforators. They're going into the deep. We have countless perforators. Some are named, some are not. So you, so you go past the uh, branch? 
up into the common, up, there's a very short segment, you don't want to shut the common femoral. Hmm. Yeah. Till whatever is abnormal. Because in this case, you see it's all popping out right here. So her case, you're just doing a very short segment right there. Now, if you, if you treat all this, it means nothing. Could you turn around that way? Turn that way? Watch this. Watch this go down. It's going to go down here, and again, the blood has to re-enter somewhere. So that's where that happens. And slowly, she's getting changes from the venous hypertension. So as the blood sits out, first is there's increased capillary permeability. So there's edema. Those red blood cells are breaking out. Then there's staining of the skin. And then those blood vessels will keep getting bigger. At some point, the skin is going to get irritated. It becomes a dermatitis. Then the fat gets hardened, lipodermatosclerosis. Then the skin oxygenation gets worse. The skin breaks down. You get an ulcer. The reverse happens as you heal it when the pressure is gone. Can you see if there's a perforator down here? Anywhere along the path. Thank you very much. Say it again. Perf just lower down a little bit here. Thank you. No, no, no. And then you spread it back in. And watch that. And she just showed you this branch going in, lower down. And that, that's. Could you do it for the branch that we followed down all the way? From uh, that anterolateral branch? Yep, yep. Follow it down. You watch those branches. So you have to be patient and just follow the branch. And it's like Braille. Sometimes you close your eyes and just feel the vessel go down all the way. And then you see where it's going and then put your ultrasound on it. Somebody's shoulder in the way. I think that's you for a moment. Can you just move your shoulder a bit? Somebody's, who is this person here? Anybody? There you go. That's you. <laughs> I absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So you see how she's following that branch? And you look at the corresponding um, site. And at some point, you'll see a perforator that is feeding from both sides. So after you treat the upper part, if you don't treat anything else, uh, and there's reflux from below as well, this will continue to stay under pressure and it'll try to recanalize what you occluded. So you kind of have to think of where is the pressure coming from and take care of both of those. Did you find it? Right there? It varies. I do it as early as a couple of days or it depends on how they feel. Yeah, you could technically. Overdoing it is a bigger problem than underdoing it. You can't undo it. Cause a DVT, you got problems now. You could do, some people would do phlebectomy on this whole thing. I just don't like to do too much and cause bruising and pain. And, and if they recanalize it, now this becomes a hematoma, all those stuff. So I, I'm going to go as simple as possible, as little as possible for the maximum benefit. Yeah, and can you, so it's not that big compared to the other one, other ones, but you'll see some where they're really large. It's bigger than the saphness, um, and you work your way through that. Okay, thank you. Now we'll look at the short or the lesser saphness, as some call. So you actually make a plan at the time of this is the patient's symptoms, this is the problem. They got an ulcer. You got pain and swelling, or it's just cosmetic. And then say, my goal of treatment is, so I would tell her, you know, what's bothering you the most? First is I've got, I don't have an ulcer, but I got pain and swelling, so that's my first goal to heal that. Then I may also want to take care of the cosmetic part of it. I don't want it to look that way. And then you work towards that goal. So when she comes in, you have to have pictures of all of this. Front, side, medial, lateral, plus your proper examination. Then you have the ultrasound, so you're seeing the lesser saphness now. And it's interesting, it's a little tortuous in the saphness. 
It looks like there might be a perforator there. Mm -hmm. There is one right there. Just So pa pause there for a second, please. You see this going across? And then follow the second one down, please. And you'll see that it'll go into a deeper perforator of sorts. Can you go back up and follow it through? There, stop. You just passed it. See that going down? That's the perforator. So it's, it's plumbing, and you just follow the pipe. If there's any doubt, you kind of put color and, and watch it. Patience, though. Patience is the key. Yes. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's actually pretty easy. The stretched vein, as long as there's some blood in it, will stay stretched. It just doesn't go back down to normal. Uh, but if it is, there's no flow, it'll thrombose immediately. So let's say you shut this part, and this was the only part of flow going down. It'll shut down. It'll thrombose. So I have one patient I've seen so far who I did the safness where this was the main source of all the reflux. She thrombosed everything because this was the main source of the venous hypertension. So you don't have to do anything? Then you don't have to do anything. Just let them heal. Um, could you see if you can track the uh, short saphenous in the popliteal and we can identify the nerve? I've tried to identify the nerve myself so many times. You see it academically in books, but right. it's very hard to do it on yeah. a daily basis. You can, but now they got dressing on both sides, and they are, then they want to be bedridden. Chances of clot goes up. You know, everywhere they say, sit with your legs up, toes above your nose. I make them walk. I actually make my patients commit to go buy a pedometer and show me a printout of 10,000 steps a day. And I make them, I teach them. I said, do the ballerina walk at home. You know, kind of. The reason is I want to get them to get their calf pump working very good. There are three pumps in the foot, the plantar, the calf, and basically the lower part, which is like a piston. So, and try it yourself. Sit in one place for a long time, then get up and actually walk with the full range of motion, and you see the difference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You go from the ankle up. You just got to be a little careful, but because the reflux in that case is from a perforator into the saphenous below. So let's say my perforator here is incompetent, right? In the, uh, and that's leaking out. And now all this is flooded, and I'm getting issues. This could be absolutely normal. Of, no. If it's not damaged, if it's normal, why? Sometimes you don't get in. So then I would go from here up to here, or just take care of that perforator first and see what, what else is happening. Yeah. I, it depends on what I see. If the perforator is the main thing leaking, I'll shut that down first and see what the benefit is. Because you don't want to overdo it because the patient's going to suffer from that Whereas, and get the least impact. So I've seen patients who, like that reflux is only here, and they've shut down from here to here. And everything is still there. They show up in my office. They've had the whole ablation. They've had the lesser saphenous ablated. But what they came in with is still there. So you want to focus where the problem is and work your way back. Did they wipe off the gel on that thing? Okay, good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Say it again, please. At the knee area. Yeah, so I'll go up to the point of where the reflux is. Like how many centimeters? I mean, Just past the branch, wherever that is. I wouldn't, I try not to ablate the normal vessel. But is it true that the varicosity in the patient DNA is going to come back from what I see in my practice? Patient comes three, four, five years. They do so have treat it five years later. So why we subject the patient to because another procedure? It, it may recanalize, it's hard to get in, and you're doing an unnecessary procedure. It's like saying, I may have a heart attack five years from now, so why don't you stent all my arteries? You won't do that. Same logic. 
Yeah, sure. I, I've never gone downstream because you're against the valve. It's better to go up this way. Say it again. Of the safness? Some people do that. The, the Veratina just got approval for that with foam. See, foam is, if you do it with room air, has nitrogen. That is what ca can cause an air embolus. Uh, they have oxygen and CO2, which are totally dissolve in blood right away. So if it goes up, it just dissolves. So there are techniques of foam coming in. Say it again, please. Oh, yes, yes. So what bothers you, ma'am? What? What bothers you in your leg? Uh, it just hurts. Just hurts. Okay. Where is most of your pain? Uh, around the knee. Around the knee. Do you have arthritis of your... Uh, yeah, doctor said, okay. How, how do you feel around your ankle? Oh, right. No problem. No problem. So one of the things to remember is... Whole leg hurts. Yeah, whole leg hurts, yeah. There are a lot of comorbidities that can coexist. So, you know, if there are five people talking in the room, the one, the loudest is what you will hear the most. Till that one keeps quiet, then you hear the other ones. So it's the same way if somebody has knee pain, arthritis, hurting them more than the else. So you'll examine the leg. And then work your way there. So she, I can see from here she's got lipodermatosclerosis, discolorations. So we know she has venous insufficiency as well. And you work. So it's, it's not an isolation. It'll be combined with multiple things going on at the same time. To look for the reflux, uh, you just do with a hand compression or you have a, a hand just, cough? Or? No, no, just hand compression. Just squeeze the calf and, and see what happens. See, the machine doesn't lie. If there's reflux, you'll see it. If there's no reflux, there's no reflux. Did you, did you see any reflux there? Not really. Yeah, so see, sometimes she's had ultrasound before, and you know there's reflux, and the room is cold, the vaso, it, it changes the pattern. So that time, you have to rely on what the patient's symptoms are. And you know that the finding for now is different You'll do it at another time, or you'll change the temperature in the room and, and figure that out. So this one shows almost no reflux. So she's been in the cold Absolutely, there you go. But I, I'm glad you're seeing this now, because you know there are enough textbooks that'll show you all this is real life. So you have somebody who comes in your office, you look at them, they, and you see it, there's a problem. And then your ultrasound's not showing it. So then, this is what we do. I'll bring her out another time. I'll say, I'll come in the room myself. We'll sit down, explain to the patient, and then go from there. Uh, yes. Uh, it, if there's incompetence, you'll see it with Valsalva too. And sometimes you don't even ask to do them. They just go, <laughs> and, and you'll see it changing. The other thing we do is actually we've got a little stand created. I think some are available commercially. They're like three steps, and they stand on top of that. Because you can have people just go vasovagal just standing for a while. They're already anxious. They don't know what's going on. And standing, and some of these, the full mapping, all of it can take 20, 30 minutes if you do a proper study. No reflux here, too. The best reflux you saw was in the last patient at the top where you saw that. Actually, let's look at a saphenofemoral junction, if you would. Now, sometimes if you have um, a lot of adipose tissue, it becomes hard. And especially when you're doing a procedure, the documentation, just the ultrasound is one thing, but doing the procedure is extremely, extremely important for you to know the saphenofemoral junction. Never assume, because and sometimes, you know, if you're catheter, 
is up in, let's say, the iliac. But your ultrasound, the way you do it, looks like the tip is right in your saphenous. You gotta triple confirm that you're not in the common femoral, especially when you're doing an ablation. Look at that junction, there we go. You're right of the common. Okay, slow down, slow down, there we go. And what was that that you just saw there, right there? Okay. So if any of you thought that superficial venous disease was just, eh, whatever, it's not. It is, it is challenging enough, and you gotta be careful. It can very easily land up uh, causing harm. That's the, that's the valve reflux right there. And uh, you see that just, there's your reflux. Yeah. You can even just hear it, just with her breathing. It's going back and forth. There was your just respiratory variation into the saphness. So I've had a patient who came to me. She was referred by a CV surgeon. She had multiple strippings done before. So in the old days, they just saw something, made an incision, cut it, pulled, 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 pulled. Now she's got very complex reflux going on everywhere. Look like a map with just things going. You start from the top, one segment at a time. Today she's got nothing visible. But I did 18 procedures on her between ablations and perforators, phlebectomy and uh, foam sclero. How you doing there? So the first few that your ultrasound tech does, you've got to be in the room to get a good idea for how this works. Do you see the patient mm -hmm. first before you do the ultrasound? Or? I always see the patient first. Yeah. And then you tell and the tech what to do one leg. Yes, yeah, so patient. first thing in your mind is the deep must be open. So I make sure the deep ultrasound is normal, no evidence. Yes. So she, what Patty said was that we'll check the waveform in the common femoral. So I always get a deep study if there's any history of prior DVT or anything else like that. Then work because if the deep, there's deep occlusions, then these are actually your collateral channels and you don't want to shut them down. I had one kid who actually had uh, a lot of interventions when he was uh, as a pediatric patient, basically had uh, congenital malformations, etc. And he came with massive reflux, ultrasound was done, and he's on the table, and I said, something's not right. He's 22 years old, why has he got all this? So I confirmed uh, his common femoral and there's no facicity. He had a lot of collaterals. So I sent him for a CT venogram, checked it, and he had the entire iliac vein occlusion. I think the comment made here. Yes. Right away. Where are you right now? Yeah. Your longitudinal, right? So common femoral vein, longitudinal view. Yeah, you were right at the junction, weren't you? And there's the valve right there. So here, and you see that flow going back and forth here a little bit? That's the valve leaflet there. Sometimes you'll just see the two leaflets just flapping away in the breeze. And you turn on color, you'll see that as well. You see how that flooded right through? That shows you the reflux right away. You saw in the normal individual, you could barely get any flow going down there. Everything has to be up. And with respiration, it doesn't change in here. It's just freely flowing back. Once you find that, then you follow that down. Keep following that branch down. She's going longitudinal now. 
Can you pause for one second and just show the transfers on that? There you go. Follow that down slowly, transfers, very slowly. There's the saphness going down, slowly. And, okay, say it again. Split, yeah, it's splitting right there, you can see too. And then she may have even a perforator then. So those are the things you have to appreciate. And then from that refluxing segment, which was dilated, you notice that this, when it split, the size wasn't that big. That means that pressure is reflect, uh, reflecting into some other branch, and you chase it around. So how would you treat? Say it again. The top part is what I would ablate. If somebody has deep reflux and superficial, then you can't treat the deep reflux. But as long if they're symptomatic, uh, yeah. But as long as you're treating what the problem is, so never treat the image. Always treat the patient. So I'm looking for what's the goal of treatment. They have an ulcer, then I'm working my way back from there. If it's just swelling, pain, then you work your way back from there. There's your saphness. You see the lesser small saphness in the fascia. We're following it down, which is going up. And keep they are still there. Past the popliteal fossa. Are you going to the geocomania or did you you didn't dive down? I didn't see that. Okay. So she's all the way up at the back of the thighs. Sometimes the lesser saphness will just extend up. And then there's called the vein of geocomania that comes up all the way and connects up to the greater saphness. It's an intercommunicating branch. So it's very important to recognize some of these patterns uh, because you would normally expect that to dive in and catch up with the popliteal. In this case, it wasn't doing that. And you can also see, can you go back for one second? I just saw uh, a perforator right there. See that fellow going down? And you can see reflux there. So believe it or not, you'll see perforators that are refluxing from the lateral side of the thigh. I've seen up from uh, deeper, profunder branches as well as from, but the secret is, where's the problem? Chase it back. You talk to a forensic accountant, they'll tell you, follow the money. You'll find the problem. This way, follow the blood flow, you'll find the problem. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, did she? I don't know. You see it right there. So there are very few cases that are just straightforward saphenous vein ablations will solve all your problems. So you it's a perforator, right? We use the vascular That's okay. Then you die, then you just take care of it just at the point of where the perforator, I don't know if you saw the video. Just you, the principle there is you don't want to ablate the deep system. So if you had a pipe that's leaking through the floor, that's your fascia, and it's uh, you know six inch, and then goes out. You want to catch it just as it comes out through the floor, and seal that. So I, I, this is how I explain to the patients. You know, it's all plumbing. I joke with them. I'm a plumber, and then they <coughs> laugh. And then I tell them I'm soldering this. And a lot of them, I show them the fibers. I let them watch the ultrasound screen or play music. So to them, it, they dissociate this whole thing with pain and anything else. She went longitudinal. She's following that up. How far up are you there? She's right at the popliteal junction. At this point, normal uh, anatomy would be where that would dive in and touch the popliteal. In this case, it's not doing that. And if you're in the calf, uh, especially the normal, we can look at that, you'll see venous lakes. And then as they contract the calves, you'll see the venous lakes uh, kind of empty out. That's how the pump works. So when you're standing, they pump, as I'm standing now, those venous lakes are just filling up with blood. 
as I lift forward and I put my foot down, my plantar surface just emptied. And then as I lift it up and squeezed my calf muscles, those venous lakes just squished up. And then when I do this, it acts like a piston and pushes whatever else is there up. That's your normal calf pump. So patients will tell me I'm using the elliptical and I'm working out and I tell them stop. I want you to get on a treadmill or go for a walk and go through the whole range of motion. Another thing patients have been told, heels are not good for them. I tell the women to wear some heels because guess what happens? They're on their toes now and then they start using their calf pump a lot more. And I encourage them to walk a lot more even after the procedure. DVT? DVT you can do supine, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You're just looking for deep clot. Yes? So you're just doing the more focal ablation where there's insufficiency as opposed to trying to ablate the whole vein. Yeah, there that, there's no reason if you have. So I've seen folks actually, they have saphness uh, incompetence of, let's say, the upper thigh only. They started at the ankle and they burnt it all the way up, got blisters and they got nerve damage and paresthesias. Why do you need to do that? So it's a simple equation. I mean, simple logic is in your house, the pipe in your basement's broken, you've got five other floors. It may rust five years from now. It doesn't mean you rip out everything now. All right. So, so she's by the posterior table and you start seeing uh, perforators down there too. You got to remember that normally perforators at the ankle can be bidirectional. So it's not always abnormal. So you have to correlate it to the symptoms. You've got swelling in one part of the foot and just one go away. Follow that back and you may see a big perforator. How would you treat that perforator? The perforator? Um, depends on, there's somewhere it's not FDA approved, but you can put a short laser fiber through a needle and just zap that thing there. For three seconds, oops. And uh, companies that have tried to kind of market it for perforators have gotten into trouble with the FDA. Uh, but yeah, what you do is you get a needle, puncture into it, get the fiber just outside, give a little to mess in the local and zap it. That goes through a uh, micropuncture. There's one that goes through a micropuncture needle, one that goes through a 19 gauge needle. Yeah, that's in another one. The, the, the short Say it again. They have a short thermal. Uh, that's the RF, the Venus. Yeah, that that is the same thing. What whether you cook with a microwave or put it on the stove, you're gonna burn it, heat it one way or the other. So with the the uh, Covidian, which is the Venus device, is FDA approved for perforators, and but that is a very straightforward focal shot that you hit to one spot, it burns in one space. Uh, very f few of those I do now with lasers, very few. Yes, let's do that if we could. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, okay. Any questions, anything else specific you want to see? I mean, you'll learn more of this as you go through with your own patients. The most important thing is correlating the symptoms, understanding the pathophysiology, and then treating that. Yeah. Well, what you do is, again, look for where the incompetence is coming from. Where is the incompetence? Where is the pressure coming from? And shut that source down. So in her case, it's not that incompetent. If it was, if it was I've gone all the way up to the geocommunity. And in fact... No, again, I mean, it's not that you'll always have... There, what you do is if you're in that segment, you apply less heat and give better to mess it. So you surround the vein with a lot of liquid so the nerves pushed away a little bit. The people who get into trouble, I mean, I do as many as 100 a month. So you can imagine the number I'm doing. The people who get into trouble who overdo it, where they overburn it, you can always burn it again if you need to, but that's when you get into some issues. What do you do with the abdominal varices? Sorry. Sorry. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Excuse me. What do you do with the abdominal varices and GSV reflux? How do you work out the patient? Abdominal varices? So if it's you have a... obvious yeah. abdominal varices. That means there's something else happening in the deep system. Keva, CDI. You start with first a very good examination history. Where is it coming from? Then you can, uh, one of the easier things to do is a CT venogram, a CT, and yeah. see what's happening. And How then. Do you exclude the higher obstruction and there's GSV uh, reflex. You go and ablate that. Yeah, abdominal varices will not happen from superficial venous disease. So it's, there has to be something else going on. And the patient is symptomatic. What you, what you tell them? Symptomatic? Symptomatic abdominal varices. Well, that, that's because they have a uh, central venous obstruction, uh, IVC or iliac obstruction. It's out. pathognomonic, huh? That's ruled out. It's already done, and it's, there's no obstruction higher. Uh, I have a hard time believing hard time that. Believing that something else. I is have going a hard. You, I would do a venogram. Uh, I wouldn't sclerose the collaterals before you. You already did a venogram. No. Oh well, then CT isn't like the. Well, you, you know what happens is when, a, seat, sure. when a, a vein is completely chronically occluded for a long time, uh, they become uh, isodense with the tissue, and you can be misinterpreted. So I, I would go with the actual venogram. Um, venogram. Well, yeah, it's a lost art, isn't it? How about ultrasound of the IVC iliacs? Have you done that? Uh, I've, there's something uh, blocked. Yeah, there's something blocked. Uh, it's got an. Uh, well, if they're vulvar, vulvar are more deep in the perineum, not on the uh, abdominal go, wall. Perfect. Thank you. But uh, if they're there, that's pathognomonic for obstruction in the iliac or distal cava. One second. Just wipe this yeah. for one second. Yeah, keep looking. So let me show you something, folks, if I may. Okay. So here's this, this lady. If you watch her ankle here, you're seeing a lot of venulectasias. There's some skin changes. It's, it's swollen. You're seeing distended veins out here. The skin is discolored. So I, I looked at it and I asked her, does it hurt? She goes, yes. I can see, obviously. When I press, does that hurt? And I can feel a little divot. If you're a golfer, you know what a divot is, right? So as I feel this, I know there has to be a perforator underneath. So some gel, and I'm looking at, and guess what I find right there? I got a perf and all these branches underneath. So when I see this, I see a whole cluster of veins. See on the screen there? And then watch that one branch that is going down, and it's also connecting up with the saphenous, and there's the perforator. Can I get some color? Can I get some color on this, please? Do you have the pointer? Oh yes. Uh, here. If you have the pointer, I'll use the laser. Can I help you out? I oh, thanks. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Can you get rid? Of, there you go. You're good. Where's the thing? There it is. So, would you avoid that perforator, or would you? Uh, yes, that? actually, in her case, you see how that filled as we just gently squeezed it. See how it so this, what I would do in this one is get to that perforator, ablate that, and foam the rest of this, all these branches. Where would you um, take the catheter for the perforator? See where it's going through the fascia right there at the top? That junction right there. Okay, very superficial. <laughs> And you can see these are the branches feeding right out of that spot. So in this case, if I look at her saphness, she's got some reflux, and it's, you can see it's large. I got it. I'm coming down. So I know that the saphness reflux is contributing, and there's a perf re-entry right here. So we know that her saphness below is also incompetent, and there you see how it jumped out, 
and there's another, obviously another branch feeding, and I can see some changes here. So actually, we actually draw a diagram of the safness and draw what part is incompetent, what's not. Can you put your foot down or just turn it around a little bit? So Romy, would you yes. tell people what your treatment plan would be? Yes, so my treatment plan in her case would be, initially, this greater safness at the top, then the greater safness below, and those two perforators. I'd create this, I'd write this up as a plan and then submit this to the insurance as well. If the GSP was not uh, refluxing at the top, then you would not treat that portion, right? It's hard to. You'd only go up to the perforator? A little more gel, please, on this side. I don't think you heard your question. If the, if the greater saphenous didn't demonstrate reflux, but you saw the incompetent perforator, I would do the then you just do the perforator. I would do the perforator. So wherever, there's the, wherever there is incompetence, and the pressure is coming from there, that's what you treat. Because the deep is higher than the superficial. Normally a superficial should be zero when supine or when you're standing 20 to 30. I can't see it right there. Okay, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. So I feel my way through that and I'm following it down further. So this one, lower down, I'm not that worried about a perforator here. I'm gonna treat the upper GSV, treat this and see what happens. If it persists, then I know there must be something else feeding here and follow it down. Yeah, it wraps further down there, doesn't it? Yep, it does, there you go. You can see it's boggy right up there. It doesn't project well on the screen higher up but I can follow it down. And I can actually feel right here, she must have a, and you can see it right there. Yep. And goes down further. But if there was no reflux down here, when you shut this, this will all thrombose. And then you can either do foam or phlebectomy at the same time. I do less phlebectomy than I used to before. Does it always Question. take so long to do venous ultrasound? Say it again? Does it always take so long? Yep. A good 30, 40 minutes. And a good one is really the, what's important. This decides your treatment, so be nice to your ultrasound tech. I'm not kidding. She leaves, he leaves, your practice stops. Has there been any role for MR venogram or CT venogram for these? No, nah, it's a waste unless it's deep. Not for the legs as much. The only time I've done it is I treated the greater or lesser, all that stuff, and the patient comes back, there's still issues. I'm like, something else is going on. So I sent her for an MR venogram, and we found perforators on the lateral tie. She, interestingly, she was the first woman plumber I really met, and she was a big, tough lady. And she had perforators on the lateral side of a tie that were feeding from the deep branches of a femoral. And then when we shut those down, she did great. If you do an ablation at the... Oh, she's got one on the other side, too. See, this one is interesting. Where it doesn't... Okay, let me... So if you look on this leg here, just on clinical exam, you can see it's coming here and then wrapping around the medial tie here, probably coming from the saphenous lower down instead of the other one, which was coming from the top and going down. Do you have some gel there with you? You can see how large that is. And there you watch how it enters the saphness right there. You see it enter the saphness, that branch? And if I had to follow it, launch, there's the saphness vein. On, in the thigh, as I come down, it's in the fascia now. It looks like the beautiful Egyptian eye. So in this case, you will ablate the saphness from right here all the way up in the thigh to the saphnofemoral junction. You see how it got tortuous there for a little bit, like a little aneur venous aneurysm, if you would, and you can see the flow. Take a deep breath. Blow it out. You see it go back and forth just with respiration? And not even. Yeah, it looks like a little snowflake. And then you follow that branch up further. I'm now reaching her 
Saphno-femoral junction, right there. Deep breath, blow it out. See that valve flapping there? Do that a few more times, please. You see the valve flapping? Little white line flew by. Yeah, and I'm compressing it if I, I've compressed the vein. You watch that vein there, you see the valve? Fluttering. Yep. Now I'm compressing it so it looks small, but what, what happens when I release it? There's, yes, can you hit color now please? And this is something, if you're gonna do ablations, you've gotta be able to demonstrate yourself, to yourself. And I actually show this to all my patients while I'm doing it. And watch this, without doing anything, watch the reflux. So the treatment plan for her is the greater saphness from here all the way down to the thigh. This will most likely thrombose if there's nothing filling it. But my guess is she's got some perforator somewhere. So when they first come to the office, what I actually do is something like that. I'm literally feeling my way, and then right there I feel a depression. Can you do that? Feel this for me? And let's see if there's a perforator right there. Some more gel, please. Yeah, you're good. So I didn't find a perforator here. And if I did, I would leave it alone. Once it's done, repeat the ultrasound and see if something's still filling it. But the pressure from the saphness is reflecting all the way down here. And once I ablate this, if this is the only source of incompetence, this will all settle down. And then she would be a good candidate for phlebectomy or whatever else but I wouldn't do it the very first time. Some people call it the exit phlebectomy. Uh, surgeons tend to do that a little more because they're used to cutting. I try to keep it minimal, let it shut down, empty the blood out, next time do a little foam sclero, shut it all down as much as possible. If it's still persistent, do a phlebectomy. For the medial, right. medial malleolus on her right Pardon foot. Me? The medial malleolus on her right foot. Yes. You said that you would do sclero. Do you get ulceration or anything like that or any fear of that? Uh, so the secret of sclero is it's got to be only in the vein and irritating the wall of the vein. If it goes into the skin, you're going to necrose the skin. So no extravasations. Any doubts, stop injection. That's the key. John. Thank you very much. We want to thank our model again. And I want to also thank Dr. Chopra. We're going to go ahead and end up right now. And if there's any other questions, um, you guys can um, you know, have a roundtable discussion. I just want to show a couple of slides as we wrap up. Uh, my name is Joffrey Golzar. For those of do you, you guys that don't know me, you want to try this mic? I got this one. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the course director. Uh, we just uh, ended our fourth year of the Chicago Endovascular Conference. Um, Dr. Patty Thorpe is the chair of the endo, uh, of this conference and um, the Venus session. Can I go forward? Um, we had 440 attendees this year. 73% of these were out of state, 3% international, and 24% in state. This is um, our large, largest audience thus far. Uh, we noted that about 43% uh, were Car uh, interventional cardiologists, and as you can see, the breakdown um, uh, as we move uh, through that chart. We also have podiatrists, phlebologists, internal medicine, cardiovascular surgeons, general cardiologists, interventional radiologists, and interventional vascular surgeons. And this has been the mainstay of this meeting, is it's purely endovascular, no cardiology, no TAVI, just arterial and venous, the only simultaneous arterial and venous meeting in the country. Next slide. Um, I want to thank all of you guys for being here. 
Um, I know you guys took time away from your practice and your families to be here. Also our faculty, Dr. Chopra, you've been an uh, incredible asset. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Dr. Patty Thorpe, thank you so much. She's been, uh, you know, she's one of the gurus and international uh, leaders in, uh, especially in deep venous uh, uh, disease, and she's dedicated her life to this and has been uh, doing this for uh, several years. And thank you so much for being part of this meeting and 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 doing this. And of course, our commercial supporters, the audiovisual team, they've done a phenomenal job. Thank you so much. Our, uh, our hotel staff, they've done a phenomenal job. And then I'd also like to introduce our, uh, CVT, our card, uh, CVC team. Uh, they've worked, come on up here, guys. They've worked uh, so hard over the past several months. Um, Gwen and Joanne with Lux Travel, uh, they've worked uh, tirelessly. I know the first day they were here, they were here till about 11 o'clock at night, getting everything set up. And some of you guys that needed travel probably also interacted, come on up stage, uh, also interacted uh, with them. And so uh, Gwen and Joanne are really, really thank you guys and appreciate everything you guys have done. And then Max uh, is our audio visual guru uh, who, uh, the, for the faculty that were you know, in the speaker ready room, I know you guys dealt with Max and he took some phenomenal pictures and we appreciate that as well. And then uh, Renee, who is the executive director who's really worked on this for 11 months. I know she's ready for a vacation, uh, but she's worked tirelessly and done a phenomenal job and put on an excellent show. Really appreciate it. Next slide. Um, there's a few spots left for the arterial and venous um, cadaver course tomorrow morning. So if you're interested, uh, definitely let us know. We have about probably 10 slot, uh, spots left. And uh, we look forward to next year, uh, July 8th through 11th, 2015. We're in the arterial side. Our focus will be the dawn of anti resinosis therapy. And on the venous side, obviously, we're going to continue to do what we're doing deep and superficial venous reflux, the comprehensive approach. I'm going to have Patty say a couple of words about next year as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Golzar and uh, all of the team. I appreciate And I particularly want to thank the AV team that stayed with me all week and trouble did all the troubleshooting for everything. And particularly this afternoon, worked hard to get the uh, projection up there, which I think was really helpful, wasn't it? And instead of just being really close by. So to next year, you can tell everyone, and I hope you come back, that we're going to have live Venus cases from several universities where people are going to be actually doing the live cases. And so we learn a lot from those, and it's exciting to see that. So it'll be, um, it, it's getting bigger and better every year. So thank you for your support. Thank you for staying here today late on a Friday afternoon. And we hope it really was beneficial to you and your practice. So reach out to us if you, if you want to when you get home through the reps or through other contacts that you know how to reach us for any kind of clinical questions. So thank you very much at all uh, for everyone. Thank you. And I just want to comment regarding CME. In your welcome bag, there was a handout that included all the details pertaining to the online CME system that we have. So it actually opens, the website will go live tomorrow, July the 12th, and it will be available through August the 12th. So you just follow the details regarding the, um, the, the, uh, the website that you will visit, you print it yourself. If you have any questions, we have another copy at the front desk. Thank you, Renee. Okay, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.